Welcome to Sure Foundation Lutheran Church's podcast channel. The following sermon was preached on the basis of Luke chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. Please join me in a prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Do you remember when you first got out on your own for the first time? Maybe it was following high school, maybe it was after college, but in any case, you were away from the the life that you, you formerly knew, the life with your parents, under their protection, under their guidance, and now you were on your own. You were blazing your own trail. And, and for many people, that can be a, a pretty exciting time of life. But it also might not be the easiest time of life either. It, you may have a, a great degree, you might have a good job, but, but still those times might be, be kind of hard. You, you might find yourself just scraping by paying for an apartment that you can barely pay for and an apartment that's really not that nice in the first place, (laughs) trying to to manage your mountain of student debt, all while trying to get just at least a twin bed and and a couch in your apartment those times. uh, Maybe you look back on them fondly, but but they're not always the easiest times. And and when you're in that, when, when you're finding yourself just scraping by, you might think back to what life was like before that, right? When you lived with your your family, when when you had a a, a nice roof over your head, maybe a pretty nice house, uh, where your parents drove, they drove pretty nice cars, they they never really worried about where their next meal was was coming from, they they had a a pretty good life. And and as you think back to that time when when you lived with your parents, you're, you're kind of a little baffled, you're a little confused, because if we're being honest, your job is probably more prestigious than your parents' was. You make more than your parents do, so what are you doing wrong? Why are you struggling to to get by and and just scraping by here? Now, of course, the the obvious answer is that that they're forgetting, you're forgetting the, the times before you were born. It makes sense that you wouldn't remember those times, right? But, but when your parents just got married and they themselves were just scraping by, barely able to pay for an apartment that, that they were paying for in, in an apartment that probably wasn't that nice in the first place. <laughs> you don't remember the times when, when you were very little and mac and cheese was on the menu four nights a week, and, and it wasn't Kraft mac and cheese either. It, it was the off-brand, you know, food club mac and cheese, <laughs> And they were driving a car that was older than, than they were, had all sorts of problems, and they had to share one. They only had one car. They wore clothes and coats that, that had holes in them. You don't remember those times. And so your frustration over your current situation is because you want your parents' life, you want an easier life, but you didn't realize the, the hard work, the struggle, and frankly, just the time that it takes to get to that point, right? You wanted their life without the work. You wanted the, the easy route. Maybe some of you had that train of thought not that long ago. Maybe it was a while ago. Maybe you've never actually thought those things before, but you can understand someone who might be thinking something like that. And I think that kind of is a great illustration to get us into our, our discussion today, that the struggle comes before the victory, the the suffering comes before the victory, that in the life of a Christian, the cross comes before the crown. So in this particular reading, uh, Jesus is in the, the region of Galilee doing what he has been doing for a while now. He is preaching to the people, he is teaching, he is healing, he is driving out demons, And he's been doing this for a solid two years. He's in his third year of doing this 
very thing. And so you could imagine that after listening to Jesus for, for two solid years, the, the, the word is going to get out about him. Uh, they're going to hear about the fact that this guy is healing diseases that no one has ever healed before. He, he's able to drive out demons. He preaches with great, great authority. And so since he's entering his third year, you could imagine there's large crowds that flock to see Jesus. And that was the case. Everywhere he went, there, there was lots of people there to listen to him. There were lots of people bringing their sick to, to Jesus to, to be healed. And so wherever he went, these large crowds gathered, and with these large crowds also came his critics. <laughs> and in this particular reading, we kind of have an unusual interaction between Jesus and his critics. His critics say to him, they, they give him a warning, actually. They say, hey, this, this guy Herod, the, the leader of this region, uh, he's out to get you. He wants to kill you. Now, you might have heard Herod before, right? And when you think of Herod, you might think back when Jesus was born, right? And the, the Herod that killed all of those, those babies in, in Bethlehem, right? Uh, of two, year, two years old and younger. This isn't the same one. Not the same Herod. But this Herod had a track record of, of murder as well, right? Um, John the Baptist was put to death under this particular Herod's rule. So it, it could have been... That, yeah, Herod was out to, to kill Jesus. That, that is certainly a possibility. But, but maybe more likely in this particular instance is that Herod was using intimidation, he was using threats because he was kind of sick of dealing with Jesus in these large crowds. He, he was kind of sick of dealing with Jesus and these critics who uh, would, would try to do stuff to Jesus but would probably also bend the ear of Herod, uh, trying, to, trying to get Herod to get these to get Jesus out of that area too. Herod's probably sick of putting up with this, and so he's just trying to get Jesus out of the region. That seems to be maybe a little bit more likely. In any case, it seems very unusual that his critics, in this case the, the Pharisees, would be the ones to come and warn him about this, this very thing. Now, you might know a little bit about the Pharisees. The Pharisees were typically the ones who were coming to Jesus with uh, some sort of evil intent, right? They were trying to trap him into saying something that was going to get him in trouble. In fact, not too long ago, they had tried to trap him in, into getting him in trouble with Herod, saying the same thing that John the Baptist did so that maybe Herod would put uh, Jesus to death. Uh, a lot of times they were planning Jesus' demise, and so it seems weird here that they are they're acting all, all benevolent and, and wanting to, to help him out. So, so could it be that Jesus stumbled across the, the few friendly Pharisees? Maybe. They existed, right? Nicodemus was a Pharisee. There, there had to be more like Nicodemus, right? But perhaps more likely is that these Pharisees knew what was laid ahead for Jesus in, in Jerusalem. They knew the trap that they had set for, that, for him in Jerusalem, and so they were trying to hurry him to, to go south from Galilee to Jerusalem so that they could fulfill their, their plan that they had there in Jerusalem. So Jesus is, is faced with, with two things here. He, he's faced with a leader who doesn't want him in the area doing the work that he's doing, and he's faced with these Pharisees who are, are trying to get him to go to Jerusalem and to uh, to do what lays ahead of Jesus and what Jesus knew laid ahead of him in Jerusalem. And so he addresses Herod first. And he kind of does it in somewhat of a, a humorous to me anyway, his way. He says, go tell that fox, I will, keep out, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And the third day, I will reach my goal. He calls Herod a fox. Now, you might, know, you might know a little bit about foxes. They're, they're normally considered a, a sly and, and tricky animal. And so that's what, what Jesus is calling Herod, a sly and, and tricky guy. But he's basically responding to him and saying, Herod, I, I respect your position. You, you know, it might not seem, seem like that from that response, but we can trust that Jesus respected Herod's position of, of authority there. But there is going to be no authority that's going to stop Jesus from doing his work here on earth. There's going to be no authority that's going to stop Jesus from preaching the word, teaching the word, healing people, and driving out demons. And so he's going to do that. He's going to do that today. He's going to do that tomorrow. He's going to do that as long as he needs to do that until he goes to die on the cross 
And the third day, when he is raised to life, reaches his goal. Nothing is going to stop Jesus from doing his work, not even Herod or his, his potential threats to kill Jesus. Then the next phrase seems to be responding to the Pharisees. He says this, In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. The Pharisees may have thought they were hurting Jesus like a steer to slaughter by, by trying to get him to go to Jerusalem, but Jesus was all, always intent on going to Jerusalem. He knew that's where this was going to end. He knew what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. And he knew the history of what happened to prophets like him in, in Jerusalem. He, he kind of brings that up, right? No prophet will die outside of Jerusalem. Because historically, God had sent prophets to the people as, as a way to reach out to them, to bring them back to him, to urge them to repent, to preach to them the good news. Yet time and time again, the Jewish people, when they had a prophet, they did not receive the prophet very well. They mistreated, that, they mistreated them, and many times they, they put that prophet to death. And so Jesus is very well, he's well aware of this history. He knows what happened to the prophets. And if he knows what happened to the prophets, he certainly knows what's going to happen to the prophet, to him, the next time that, that he goes to Jerusalem. And so you could imagine how sorely the devil tempted Jesus with that very knowledge. And you might think, if Jesus knew what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem, then why wouldn't he avoid Jerusalem at all costs? There had to be plenty of opportunities to take an exit off the interstate that was headed to Jerusalem, so why didn't Jesus take one of those exits? But as we think of Jesus' temptations to, to maybe do something like that, we ought to think about the opportunities that we have to do something similar like that. When you're presented with two options in your life, one being an easy one and one being a difficult one, which do you choose? That's not quite getting there yet, though. Let, let's, let's say it this way. When you're presented with two options in life, one is easy and the other is God-pleasing, which do you choose? Often, what is easy is set up in direct contradiction to God and what God commands. But still, we're not at the heart of it yet, because what we're basically talking about here is cross-carrying, picking up our cross and following Jesus. And the heart of cross-carrying is not just doing what is difficult. Jesus doesn't call you to always pick the difficult route in life. The heart of carrying your cross is self-denial, which is difficult. It's saying no to what I desire and doing what God commands. It's saying no to what I desire and looking out for what's best for, for others. It's putting to death the me first mentality and putting God and others first because, frankly, what is easy is doing what I want, when I want, whenever I want to do it. What is difficult, what is a cross, is putting God and others first and denying myself. And, and by nature, <laughs> that's a struggle for us. By nature, we want to put ourselves first. By nature, we convince ourselves that we are more important than God and what God commands, that we are more important than what, uh, what other people need or want. And what we're essentially doing is denying our cross. We, we might even see a direct passage in Scripture that speaks against what we are doing or saying or thinking, and we might try to rationalize that a little bit too. I, I can see that direct passage in Scripture, but, but you know, God will understand. In the end, God just wants me to be happy anyways. And really, you know, it's maybe not that bad of, of a thing to do anyways. And if it, if it is in God's eyes, he certainly will forgive me anyways. We choose ourselves over God. We choose ourselves over others. And, and when we're doing that, we are denying the cross. We want the crown without the cross. It's a temptation that Jesus faced 
The devil levied this temptation against Jesus again and again. Jesus, just, just take the easy route, right? We, we heard about it last week. Jesus is, is in, the, in the wilderness. He was there for 40 days. He didn't eat a thing. And the devil came to him and tempted him. And we saw it specifically in the temptation where he took Jesus up on top of the mountain. You remember that one? He's up on top of the mountain with, with the devil. And, and the devil shows Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world and says, I'll give you all of these if you just bow down to me. And you know what that would have meant for Jesus? That would have meant no suffering. It would have meant he could have had all these things that he saw right in front of him without having to suffer. That would have meant the the easy route. You can bet that Jesus was tempted with that very thing throughout his, his life. To deny his cross, to avoid Jerusalem, to choose his comfort and his well-being over God's commands, to choose his comfort and his well-being over the, the spiritual well-being of the entire world. Yet, what we see from Jesus is not a denying of the cross, we see him embracing the cross, right? He's not on Herod's timeline, he's not on the Pharisee's timeline, He's on his own. He's going to go to Jerusalem to die there, just like all of the prophets before him died there. And he was determined to do that. He was determined to carry out the will of the Father. There was nothing that was going to stand in his way. No leader that was going to stand in his way. No no opponent like the Pharisees who was going to stand in his way. He was going to Jerusalem to do the will of the Father. He was determined He was determined to put you first, to to go to Jerusalem, to die on the cross, to take away all of your sins and to complete his work there. Jesus came to save sinners. He he didn't go to die for the quote-unquote good people, right? He he came to die for sinners, for for people that rejected him continually, for, for people like you and I who continue to sin against him. He went to the cross to die for for you. Look at how he talks about the people that still rejected him at this very moment, the the people that would be putting him to death. Look at his heart for these people. This is is mostly a law statement, right? But you can see the, the gospel heart of Jesus here as he longs for his people. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather you together like a hen ga- as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Jesus wasn't looking for a little spark of goodness in these people to warrant his death on the cross for them. He wasn't looking for anything in them. He was going to, out, out of a, 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 an act of complete grace and mercy, go to Jerusalem and die there for those people, whether they believed in him or not. Whether they believed in him or not, he would enter into Jerusalem And the next time they would see him, they would be saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The words that were spoken on on Palm Sunday, as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on on a donkey, they said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But because of Jesus going to Jerusalem like that, he can say the same for you. He, He can say, You are blessed because you come in the name of the Lord. You are blessed because you are saved. You're forgiven for putting yourself first. You're forgiven for denying your your cross. You're forgiven for taking the easy route. And because you are forgiven, because you are saved, one day Jesus is going to come back again. He's going to come back to judge the living and the dead, and you'll greet him with a smile on your face, and you'll say the same thing that they said. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he'll say the same of you. Blessed are you who come in the name of the Lord. Come enjoy eternal happiness. Until then, we we really shouldn't be surprised. We really shouldn't be surprised if if our cross looks a little bit like Jesus's. (laughs) You're not going to be dying for the sins of the whole world. Absolutely not. But you will have a cross. Jesus tells us about that. That that we will need to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. And, And as we've learned today, the cross comes before the crown. But it's Jesus' cross that enables us to carry ours. It's Jesus' cross that enables us to deny ourselves and put God and his word and his commands first. 
It's Jesus' cross that enables us to, to not look to the welfare of, of ourselves first, but look to the welfare of, of others. It's Jesus' cross that strengthens you to, to carry yours. And it's only through Jesus' cross that your cross will one day be a crown. Amen.